SpaceX Starlink global outage, a glimpse behind the curtain. Let's get into it. Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. Thank you so much once again being here this morning. I hope you have your cup of tea, maybe a cup of coffee as we hang out, chit-chatting about tech and space, SpaceX, Starlink, AI, Linux, all kinds of great stuff. Today is going to be a SpaceX Starlink day. Yesterday, well, there was an outage, and we're going to talk about that outage and dig in a little bit deeper into the superficial that we see online. And a lot of them say a bunch of nothing, so we want to dig in a little bit deeper as we do on this channel. I'll go through a few of these articles that were semi-okay, and then I'll give you my commentary and what I think about all this. But more importantly, I want to hear from you down below. I want to hear what you think about it. Is this something that affected you? If it did... How long did it affect you? I think that this was about an hour long outage. Some people only experienced a few minutes, some a lot longer. The folks over there in the Ukraine with uh, their telemetry down for that hour or so probably wasn't that great. They weren't able to do any kind of strikes or defense. The Ukraine military is really relying on Elon Musk, SpaceX, Starlink, which I think is kind of sad. You don't want to put all of your eggs in one basket. And what's really odd to me is Starlink is a commercial service. It is not a government service. It's not a military service. So our Starlink here in the U.S. for military use, instead of Starlink, it's Star Shield. And it doesn't go down like Starlink does, all right? There is a lot more redundancy going on there. Anyways, we're going to get into this article. Once again, I want to hear from you down below. What do you think? Put an emoji if you don't want to put something down there because you're shy. Put in a poop emoji. Put a rocket. I'm okay. Whatever. It's helpful. Anyways, before we get into this article, I want to say that if you enjoy the content, throw it a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe. If you're not, if you are, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Click the notification button here so when I go live, when a new video comes out, you'll be notified of it immediately. That's what they say, at least. YouTube doesn't do it. Anyways, if you want to say thank you for all of my hard work on this channel, there's a thanks button. Click on that. Give a dollar or two if you like. If not, it's perfectly fine. Consider becoming a member of the channel. That would be even better. And if you haven't taken a look at any of my merch, check it out over at jchristina.com forward slash shop. If there's something there you like, pick it up. Help support me and my family. And finally, if you want more SpaceX Starlink content, I have over 560 videos I think I've put together for you in the last 50 plus months. I'll put a link here. Don't click on it yet. I'll put a link here. When you're done watching this video, check that out. There's a lot of good helpful how-tos, tips, tricks, what to do, what not to do, what to buy, what not to buy, and of course the why behind all of it because this channel is about the what? The why. <laughs> Anyways, let's jump into this article. It starts out by saying, when SpaceX Starlink users around the globe suddenly lost service in the early hours of September 15th, it felt like deja vu. Reports spiked within minutes with tens of thousands cut off from satellite internet service that many now depend on work, streaming, and most critically, frontline communications in Ukraine. Service returned within an hour, but the silence from SpaceX about root cause has sparked questions that deserve a closer look. Could it be a DNS or routing collapse? One theory that often emerges during sudden, wide-reaching outages is a DNS or routing failure. In other words, the system that tells user terminals where to find Starlink services simply stops working. Think of it as the internet phone book going blank. That's a good way to look at it. The satellites are still overhead, dishes are powered on, but the addresses they need to connect to are missing or unreachable. During previous disruptions, users report their terminals endlessly cycling, hunting for a connection that never comes. That pattern fits a back-end DNS or routing collapse, an issue that can spread instantly worldwide and leaving dishes stranded in search mode until engineers restore the directory. Once again, until engineers put the phone book back together. So it's not blank. <laughs> the software bug hypothesis. The more mundane but often more likely culprit is a software bug. In July, Starlink admitted that an outage was tied to a, quote, core software services in its network. That instance lasted over two hours and left engineers scrambling to patch the failure. 
When you're running a constellation of more than 6,000 satellites in a growing base of millions of users, even a tiny misconfiguration or faulty update can ripple across the globe in seconds. Software bugs explain both the speed at which the outage spread and the speed at which it was fixed. Once engineers roll back a bad update or reset a failed service, the network can snap back online immediately. The September 15th outage had that same short-lived profile. Failed internet services, the smoking gun. Another possibility, and one many analysts see as most convincing, is the failure of Starlink's internal services. These are the unseen systems that authenticate users, assign IP addresses, and keep data flowing between satellites and ground stations. Those are the gateways. When they fail, the satellites may still be overhead, the dishes may still be powered up, but nothing connects. Evidence for this theory comes from both the July outage and posts attributed to SpaceX's insiders who cited, quote, failed internal services as the trigger. While unconfirmed, it aligns with the pattern, global disruption, rapid acknowledgement, and a quick but opaque recovery. What it means going forward. Whether the September 15th outage was sparked by a DNS failure, a software bug, or an internal service crash, the message is clear. SpaceX Starlink's strength, its centralized, software-defined network, is also its vulnerability. Until SpaceX provides a full postmortem, users are left with educated guesses, past evidence, and the reminder that even the most advanced systems can stumble. So. I think this stuff is interesting because as a past system administrator, I love to try to figure out exactly what went wrong and what is the story. What is the story behind the story? Once again, what is going on behind the curtain? And I did a video and I talked about how their DNS works. I did another video that explained how data comes to you, how it is, let's say, how it traverses the Starlink network. Um, I've done a lot of videos that really go into the technicality, so I'm not going to get into that so much today. But a couple of things that I want to bring to your attention that could lead to maybe a conclusion as to what happened here, or at least why it happened. Um, number one, SpaceX Starlink runs their own backbone network, right? They're not running on a public service backbone, right? They are running their own backbone network and it stays in its network until asking, let's say, Google to do a search. The search comes back, it gets back into their network and your data stays there until you get it back. All right. That means it goes from your point of presence, which is your pop, back to your gateway or your ground station up to the satellite and back down to you. It stays in that network. Well, there's a lot of systems that are in place that does this centralization of your information. And once again, this is a positive thing and it's a negative thing. It's a positive thing because it's highly secure. It's a negative thing because it adds a single point of failure. So if something in that system breaks, it can break everything. So the satellites kind of act autonomously. They're the ones that do the tracking, they do the handoffs, they do the authentication, the routing. Those routing decisions usually happen on those satellites. What is going on? The handshakes, as they move over the nodes, right, each specific location, they're handing off your traffic to the next satellite that's coming through overhead. That's just simply how it works. So let's look at it this way. Some of you guys will know what a VM is, a virtual machine. Basically, a virtual machine is a, a software-based entire machine. So you can create or spin up a virtual machine and do whatever you want in it, delete that file, and the whole entire machine is gone, right? They're very, very useful, but it's a little bit slow. So instead of using virtual machines, okay, they end up using these containers. It's kind of like a Docker. If you guys know what Dockers are, basically it's like a container that houses the only the specific stuff that is needed for that program. Instead of housing an entire OS or operating system, it might just have the application and whatever um, dependencies that it needs and all the rest of the stuff. That's it. That's what's in that Docker. All right. And then what ends up happening is you have something like a 
curb nets, a, let's say, traffic controller, a conductor, the orchestra conductor, let's say, that tells the system to spin up or spin down these instances. So the way I look at this is if you had a problem with a specific container or a docker, it's not really the issue because as soon as that docker fails, it will spin up a duplicate of it in a split second. So that's not an issue. The issue is when the conductor has to go and take a pee. <laughs> and the conductor is gone. Now what happens? It doesn't know what to spin up, spin down. What is going on? It's lost. So I feel like in this situation, the conductor had to use the restroom. He left and no one knew what the heck to do anymore for an hour until they spun him back up or brought him out from the bathroom so he can start conducting stuff again. All right. Now, I don't know if that's a good analogy or not, but hopefully you get the idea here. These orchestrators or these master software programs that are the air traffic controllers, let's call them, they really need to work, all right? And when they don't work, everything breaks. So it could be something wrong with DNS, right? That's happened before. We've seen that happen before with authentication, with the certificates and whatnot. But I don't think that's the case. I think it has something to do with these back-end orchestrators that just failed. That's what I think. There was probably an update that ran through. It failed. And once that failed, now things couldn't communicate any longer. Once they bring that thing back up, in other words, rolling back to a previous version, that's the easy way to do it, or simply reboot it, respin it up. Now, all of those dockers get rebuilt. All of those instances get rebuilt and everything's copacetic again. So what exactly do these instances do? Well, they do the authentication. They do the identification of each user. Each user has an ID, right? That instance, that user. And there's millions and millions of them. That's just for the users. But then they also keep track of sessions. There's a lot of sessions. You might have multiple sessions going on the internet through multiple computers in your home, for example. Each one of those is a different session. It has to keep track of those also. It also does the routing, that system monitoring. Where does it need to route the traffic to? That is very important. It also does all of the cryptography, all of the security, the encryption, all of those keys, all right? So when one satellite moves away from your area, it passes your keys and your session, all of the tokens and all of the buffer, all of it over to the next satellite. So now it takes care of you as it's over your area on the grid. Also, of course, it does telemetry and health and it works on policy management or QoS or quality of service and quotas and all the rest of this kind of stuff. But where it gets really interesting is that we look at this as the orchestrator that is on, let's say, the ground station, right? He's located in the gateway, for example. Well, Things get really, really interesting when the orchestrator now has to pass his information or hers to another orchestrator, to another gateway. Why would that happen? Think about it. Mobility. So if you have, for example, a mini and you're traveling across country, you're gonna basically get handed off from one ground station to the next ground station to the next ground station to the next, in comparison to just being handed off from satellite to satellite to satellite when you're stationary. So it exponentiates the possibility of issues, this mobility, but they do it. And they do it in milliseconds, which is absolutely amazing. So when we see this kind of stuff happening and there's an outage for an hour, you need to understand what is going on on the back end. And it is absolutely amazing. It is a miracle that all this could actually happen within milliseconds. It is absolutely amazing. And then to be able to fix it as quick as they do is also amazing. I can tell you as a past system administrator working on fiber, working on fiber channels, all the rest of this stuff, I can tell you when things get sideways, sometimes it doesn't take an hour. Sometimes it takes a day. There is a lot of stuff that can go wrong and to figure it out is not easy. 
And that means that whatever they're doing over at SpaceX with their internal centralized, not decentralized, centralized network, they're doing a great job at logs and being able to parse through logs to figure out exactly where the issue was so that they know exactly what needs to fix. If not, you'll be running ragged trying to find the problem, never mind fix it. Also, we notice that the outages are always right around the witching hour, right around that midnight hour till 3 a.m. I told you this in the last video, the video before that, when I talk about these outages. When you see an outage that happens between midnight and like 3 a.m., 4 a.m., chances are it's due to a rollout of an update of some kind. Whenever a system administrator like myself rolls out any type of update, we do it when there's the least number of people online. So when we break things, <laughs> there's not as many people that know about it. So when you see an outage that happens between midnight and let's say 3 a.m., just rest assured it has to do with something that they broke. It didn't just spontaneously break. It was an update that ended up failing. That happens a lot. You change, let's say, software, and then you install or inject the new software and you reboot or you rehub let's say the system, and guess what? It doesn't work or it doesn't come on or the specific new code ends up failing something else. That happens a lot too. When you don't have two teams talking very well together and one guy's stuff breaks another guy's stuff, Microsoft, you know what I mean? So anyways, this kind of stuff happens. I'm glad that they were able to rectify it within an hour. For me, what I would like to see from SpaceX is for them to come up with some type of online means of monitoring outages. We don't need to go to like down detector or somewhere else to see how many people are out. No, just show us, all right? Just show us. It's okay. It doesn't make a difference, all right? We understand. Just show us. Make it publicly available so that people like myself can actually tell people exactly what's going on if we would like to and not go on to down detector and try to figure out and extrapolate based on how many people are actually reporting it and how many people there are coming up with a number, which is usually like a 10 multiplier, 12 multiplier, which is kind of crazy. But anyways, that's my suggestion to SpaceX. Make it very, very public. Make the amount of people very public, how many people are out, and then you can see how they just get less and less and less and less during the fixes, all right? Because most of the time the fixes are happening now within an hour. There was only, I think it was July, was a two hour event. That was a long one, all right? But for the most part, these outages only last about an hour or less. Anyways, guys, I hope you found this interesting. It was a lot of fun putting together. If there's some questions that you have down below in the comments, let me know. And if I have the answer for you, or maybe someone else does, they'll reply, all right? Put whatever you would like down there. It doesn't make a difference to me. Once again, if you don't wanna write anything in the comment area, just put an emoji. That's perfectly fine. At least I know that you got to the end of the video. Anyways, guys, many blessings to you and your family. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay connected, hopefully through SpaceX Starlink, and we'll see you in the next one. Love you guys.